Okay, we're going to continue in our, in our series exploring Ecclesia called out. Amen. Ecclesia called out. And I'm going to be going deeper into this on, on Thursday. And talking about Ecclesia and going deeper, uh, you may ha- get notice that we have our Logos Numa Institute. Um, you've got to fly. We'll be telling you more about that and how you can earn your uh, certificate, degrees and master's degrees, or however the Lord leads you. Amen. So we're talking about ecclesia, and it's a call out. Last week we talked about ecclesia, which is the word for church. And on Thursday we talked about how the word ecclesia, that is a New Testament term, for the called out people of God. And the emphasis is not upon structure, but upon people. And I explained also that the word church uh, in the anglicized form um, through the Latin and the Greek and the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon, the Latin and the English, uh, and also the German became Kirk and, and, and also Sirk. Now, Cirque was more of a way of calling the assembly, um, and it was where we get the word circus. And so the word ecclesia, the called out people of God, uh, moved over time to, to not just talking about people, but talking about places. And so from there we get to talk about cathedrals, in church buildings. But in the original usage of the term church, it's always been about people. Amen. It's never been about structure. And in fact, Jesus, although he went to the synagogue, his church was a mobilized church that was in the community. Amen. Amen. And so we talked about that, and that uh, the sacred assembling of ourselves is where the power happens. And it doesn't only happen in the church building, it can happen anywhere you are. How many of you know that miracles can happen at the bus stop, at the train station? You don't need to be in a church building, miracles can happen anytime. Matter of fact, people were walking past Peter and they brushed him and in shadow and miracles happened when they were on the way to the market. Oh, may God bless us. And so we want to talk about today now, we're going to move to not talk, talking about Ecclesia as the assembling, but also Ecclesia as koinonia or fellowship. Ecclesia as koinonia, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so Acts chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There's that word in koinonia. In breaking the bread and prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And so fellowship, authentic fellowship, is what we are called to do. Now, the idea of connection is very popular today. In fact, in a globalized world where people, systems and economies are woven together in complex complex systems and they're all meshed together. We are con- connectivity is really the buzzword. People talk about the world wide web. We are web together. The value of connectivity is now highly prized because we are emerging from the throes of worldviews and mindsets that privilege and prioritize individualism and subjectivity to one that wedded together along the lines of mutual benefits and interest. 
We are emerging from what Descartes calls, I think, therefore I am, to a modern maxim of, I am because I am connected. I'm, I exist, and I know I exist because I am connected. So the world has never been more connected than we are today. Companies are laying millions of miles of fiber optics and shooting satellites into space. Social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn enable people from all over the globe, from various backgrounds and locations, to be connected. International travel, the ease and affordability of air travel have made it possible for people to travel distant countries and experience different cultures. We can talk about glo the global supply chain. Many products we use daily are manufactured, not just down the road or in Simi Valley or even in California, but way across the seas. Cross-border communication with advanced telecommunication technologies. We have cultural exchange programs that we do as well. We have international news coverage that the proliferation of digital media platforms gives us 24-hour news channels ensures that the major events and developments across the world are landed right in your living room. Online learning program like the Logos Numa, which is, which is going to be at a, a church near you, is also. But let me tell you, despite the illusion of constant connectivity, genuine human connection seems to be increasingly elusive. The digital age has ushered in an era where superficial interaction often, often masquerade as meaningful relationship, leaving individuals yearning for authentic relationship and connection and intimacy. And as people spend more and more time behind screens, engaging in curated online person persona and fleeting interactions, the depth and richness of real life connection is being increasingly diminished. Despite the allure, I would say, of the virtual network, the human heart longs for genuine face-to-face -face interaction and meaningful relationship that transcends the boundaries of cyberspace. So before we, as the people of God, are drawn into this superficial web as a paradigm for the way we do church, the way we understand what being connected is all about, we need to go back to a biblical understanding of what it means to be in fellowship. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And so we want to take a fresh look at koinonia and fellowship. A fresh look. Now, first of all, we want to look at the word fellowship. Now, the word fellowship, as you can see on the screen, is derived from the Greek word koinos. And the word koinos means common or shared. Thus, koinonia means and implies a sense of, and this is important now, participation, mutual sharing, and hallelujah, and uh, participation. That's what it's all about. It's about participating in something. And so be, to be in koinonia often refers to the deep spiritual fellowship. Somebody say deep fellowship. Fellowship and unity amongst believers. Now, I want to use as my base text today, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, as we read. Then those, and this is uh, Luke Acts, so you know that the Gospel of Luke, Luke the great physician, also wrote Acts of the Apostles. And when you read Luke, the idea of fellowship, connection, 
is very important for Luke. He's not too interested in individual personalities. He's more interested in the connection between people. And the Bible said, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, 3,000 souls were added. Now, a lot of people, when they read this passage, this is the way they stop. 3,000 people were saved. What a revival. What a message he preached. When Brother Luke stood up in Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. Now, even though that may be fascinating, I don't believe that was Luke's main point. Because Luke was aware that during the time of Jesus, that many times 5,000 people got saved. You know, so many thousand gathered. Because I believe the point that Luke was making, and what most people miss, is that the key to this text is not the 3,000 that was saved, but in verse 42, and, somebody say they. They. And they continued steadfast, hallelujah, in the apostles' doctrine, and this is the kicker right here, and koinonia. Why? Why? Because in that time, you had people who were from the Middle East. They were Iranians and Syrians and all kinds of people who were Jews and Gentiles. These were people who were from the Middle East and they were Iraqis, they were Persians and they were Arabs. They were people from Africa, Cyrenia and Egypt and Libyans. And, and then there were the Europeans, they were the Romans and the, and the Greeks and many others, the Italians. And then you had those who were Gentiles and proselytes and proselytes and those who were Jews and what, what Luke was saying and all of these people that came from the east and the west they came from all over the world they got together and they formed one people Amen. that was the point he was making and they being many became the interconnected ecclesia, the people of God. Now on earth could that happen? How on earth could you get people who are from such different backgrounds to become, and listen to what the scripture said, um, and they continue that when you, the word steadfastly infers that they were resistance to them coming together. They were resistance to them being the called out people of God. But they remained in the apostles' doctrine. And so the point he's making here, the first point, is that it was the degree of diversity where the miracle existed that they became one people. Now, you may not be excited about that, but I'm telling you, Luke was pretty impressed with it. Because you know when people have deep-seated traditions and culture, when people have their own ways of doing things, they have their own flags, they have their own dances, their own histories, and when they come together, everybody is wanting to make their claim to put their man in the top, their woman on the top. But Luke said they came together as one people. And that, and particularly during the early church time, that was incredible. Poor people, rich people, people who were in the military, people who were in the marketplace, came together and formed the koinonia. Deep, intensive fellowship. And so let me push this a little bit further. Luke's theology of koinonia, and those who were gladly received were baptized, and we talked about the 3,000, and the koinonia they met breaking bread and in prayer. Luke's theology of koinonia is also echoed. I don't want you to catch this. It's echoed in Joel chapter 2. When Luke stood up in Pentecost to preach, he chose this passage. And it came to pass. Now, 3,000 people got saved. 
And it came to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see vision. Now stay with me now. There are two things I want to bring to you here. You have the idea that Luke could be saying that the emphasis of this passage is what God as prophesied would take place in the future time. This passage was, 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 was spoken many years before. So it, it could have talked about this in terms of eschatology or the doctrine of the last things. For example, it could have said that this, the main point of this passage is that this was prophesied. And this was a prophetic action that was taking place that was pronounced many years ago. That could have been the main point that he was making. That's a valid point, don't you think? But notice that Luke, his emphasis was not on the doctrine of the last days or eschatology, but his emphasis was upon pneumatology or the Holy Spirit. Why was that? Luke didn't go on and talked about the things that could be happening in the last days, but the emphasis of this verse was not upon the doctrine of the end times, but the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because New Luke understood that for this prophecy to come to pass, it will not be, be come to pass because of politics, it will not come to pass because of culture, it would take the power of the Holy Spirit to bring people together. It would take the power of the Holy Ghost. So Luke said that the prophecy is what the Spirit was going to do and not what men was going to do. Oh, hallelujah. So Luke gave us a pneumatology or a spiritualization or a spiritual understanding that in the last day, the essence of koinonia would be the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit. That's why in Luke, we read in Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord was upon me. That's why Luke talks about in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. Luke knew that for anything to happen, it's not going to be because we came together. It's going to be because there was a greater unity. It's going to be because there was something that was moving in heaven. And the, the Bible says, and something moved in heaven. Because unless there is going to be unity, there has to be a heavenly movement so go ahead and contrive contrive and look at different ways that we can have equality we can have um, representation but as long as the spirit is not involved you would always get people who are trying to in, trying to cocate this and contrive this in a way let me move on I think the next point I would like to make, and I want to go a bit deeper, if I can. Can I go a little bit deeper? Yes. In Luke's understanding, because I think this is really relevant for us. Now, I want to draw the Apostle Paul into this picture. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, I want you to, to all to read it together. Go on, say, one, two, three, the... Hallelujah. So, note this down in your notes. I don't think I've wrote it down. Grace, Christ, is the source of grace. God, or the Father, I should say, is the source of love. But the Holy Spirit is the bond of fellowship. In order to understand fellowship. And so Saint Augustine says, in understanding that if you're going to have real fellowship, it has to be something, real koinonia has to be something that the spirit does. We can have we can have life groups all day. You could have life groups in every city in the world. You could have people who are trained in life groups. 
People who are skilled at delivering Bible studies. And all you're going to have is a classroom of people studying. But they will not be the deep fellowship with God. You see, what, what um, the script Paul was actually saying is that fellowship is something not that we create, but that we are invited to. When, we, when the Spirit comes, the Spirit comes not to, to make us get along. The Spirit, oh, I'm getting excited about this. The, the Spirit does not come to say, I'm going to, the Spirit is not a diversity officer. I'm going to make sure that we all get along and we're going to make sure that everything is done equally and everybody is, from, and, and those who are from the minority groups and everybody else are all represented. The Spirit is not interested in our earthly contrived forms of unity. What the Spirit does, it draws us into the fellowship of the Spirit and draws us into the divine corner near of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit draws, the Spirit says, now you are a part of the people of God, the family of God. I'm going to draw you into the sweet fellowship that we have been enjoying for eternity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit draws us into that fellowship. Now, when the church of God comes together, We are not going to just integrate people and build numbers in our church. That is not what we're about. We have to draw people into a wonderful, sweet fellowship that is not just something you have gained because your name is on the roll and you have your designated seat in the sanctuary. You are drawn into a mystical powerful community that when you are drawn into it you feel validated you feel loved you feel accepted you're dr- he said, I don't know what it is but there's something up that happens to me because I'm a part of this group Koinonia one of the most popular and profound theologians in our modern time Jürgen Moltmann says the spirit does not merely bring about fellowship with himself. Many of you talk about, I mean, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But he himself issues from his fellowship with the Father and the Son. The fellowship into which he enters with the believers correspond to his fellowship with the Father and the Son. And there is, there is therefore a Trinitarian fellowship. If you're not running around the church right now, you have missed the point that the Spirit that comes down from heaven at Pentecost is on a mission. The Spirit then, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's not just for you to speak in tongues and sound spiritual. That's the means by which the Spirit now, because of the connection in you, you now have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because before Paul said you were dead in trespasses and sins, and whenever the Spirit was trying to draw you, there was nothing to draw, you were like a ghost, you were like a corpse, but when you become born again, and you receive the Holy Spirit, the Bible said the Spirit of God draws you into fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So your community, the milieu, the environment of your community, what we see here is a shadow of a greater and more profound unity that exists in the Godhead. That's the koinonia. That's the the fellowship. And when you're in koinonia, when it comes, it's invisible but it's tangible. Koinonia is from, and what Luke is saying, you have to understand from Babylon to Pentecost. Many tongues. You know the story of Pentecost, of Babylon. 
when God divided the tongues and the language and he brought about division and the people were scattered all over the world God was always getting ready to reverse that it was at Pentecost when they were gathered together the many tongues the many cultures the many peoples all gathered together at Pentecost but when the spirit came down they began to say wow we hear them speaking in our own language you see there was one it wasn't the lingua franca but there was one spiritual language that transcended the words and the terminologies of the of, 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 of the divine speech. So when they began to hear what the Spirit was saying, and so Pentecost is a reversal, a reversal of Babylon. And so in my effort to convey, well, so what is the face of Koinonia? What is the face of Koinonia? When do you know that you have not just stepped into an organized church, but you've stepped into a transcendent community? You've stepped into something bigger than a physical organization. When do you know that? First of all, Koinonia is a movement. Buildings don't move. Koinonia is a movement, a restoration that happens deep inside you and, from the, and it works from the inside out. First of all, koinonia begins when you come to fellowship with your own self. When you stop trying to be somebody else. When you stop trying to run away from God. When you stop trying to conform to human uh, ideas of success and beauty. When Koinonia begins when you recognize that God loves me. God accepts me. God does not condemn me. Why am I trying to condemn myself? There must be an homecoming of your own self when you understand that I am accepted by God. And I choose to accept accept myself. No longer am I going to be debasing myself, speaking negative about myself. God, I, there's a homecoming because I'm, there's a homecoming in which I'm coming home to myself. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God loves me. Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Cornelia What's that say? Can somebody read that? Koinonia is what is happening when God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit have freedom to be unrestrained and fully revealed in and through. You see, we like to constrain and control, and we do that through organizations. But koinonia is what is happening when the Holy Spirit and the Trinity has unrestra is unrestrained by unrestrained by our liturgy, unrestrained by our tradition, unrestrained by our ecclesiology, unrestrained by our perceptions and our human understanding of church. Koinonia is what happens when the Holy Spirit begins to move and to reveal in us and through us what fellowship is about with the Lord. So what is koinonia? What is the face of koinonia? Koinonia it's love that comes without prejudice. Pride. You know when it comes. Love comes because you know the things that we have. But when koinonia comes, the love comes without prejudice. Yes, there are things that you are failing to do. Yes, you may look a certain way. Yes, you may have a certain past. Yes, you may have a, a dubious or suspicious character. But when you step into a place where there is koinonia love, where there is authentic fellowship, there is no prejudice. Pride or judgment. Koinonia is a fellowship of intimacy 
that transcends barriers of social status, ethnicity, gender, and economic disparities. Koinonia is a fellowship that does not predicate itself. It does not decide who's in and who's out based upon these categories. It's based upon that you are accepted by God. So what is koinonia? Koinonia is honest, open, and authentic me, being free to unveil my true self without fear of rejection. I want to be honest about where I am and my struggles, but I'm afraid you're not going to be able to handle it. You're going to look at me in a certain way. So when I come, I wear a mask. I mask my pain. I mask my addiction. I mask my struggles because if I was to be who I really was, you wouldn't like me. And so we have a masquerade where everybody comes and pretends that they are on the glory side. But if pastor's going to visit your home, you have a heart attack. <laughs> because the, even though you're, you're running around the church, your home don't reflect that. Sometimes you're going to visit people's homes, you need, two, you, need, you, need, you need to give them two weeks to prepare. <laughs> so they can align their home with, with their church persona. <laughs> Cornelia says, right now, this is how I am. This is who I am. Can you handle me if I really tell you the truth? What's that... that, that uh, movie that says somebody knows you can't handle the truth that's the point if I tell you the truth will you still love me because you know I need you to love me but I'm struggling because I I can't keep up the efforts that I have to to, to exude for you to accept me because the truth being told I don't like myself and I'm struggling and I'm doing things that are very ugly. And I come to church. And I cannot unveil my true self. Because I know you will not be able to handle it. If that is the case, we have an organization. We are not the koinonia that exudes unrestrained love. That no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, I'm going to embrace you and I'm going to believe with you that, you, they, that better days are ahead for you. I can handle your doubts. I can handle your struggle. I can handle your struggles for, 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 for same-sex relationship. I can handle your struggles for, 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 for extramarital relationship. I can handle your struggles that you are struggling with addiction. I can handle all your struggles with depression and anxiety. Bring it here. Because we are people. And quite frankly... It's too difficult trying to live in a community where everybody b- pretends that they're perfect. Yeah. And if you find a perfect church, make sure you don't go there. Yeah. Koinonia is a culture of radical acceptance that saturates broken and weary hearts until wounds become testimony. Koinonia is a banquet of communion where brokenness is offered as bread and compassion is poured out like wine. Notice that at the very essence of Christianity, is brokenness. 
That's why Islam cannot cope with Christianity. Hey, wait a minute. Are you going to tell me that God brings a wimp into the world and he, he gets crucified and beaten and beaten up and hung upon a cross? That's not the kind of God we serve. Our God brings a warrior into the world. At the center of our faith It's a cross. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Because what that is, is an invitation for all people. Bring your brokenness through the cross so you can experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So you don't have to come perfect. Because God has made it possible through Christ that your brokenness can be incorporated in Christ so you can experience the resurrection power that Jesus brings. And your brokenness is offered as bread and compassion as wine. So what is koinonia at I close? Koinonia is a sacred pilgrim, pilgrimage where the weary travelers find rest. And those people, weary travelers, looking for a church, looking for the right church, looking for the right pastor, looking for the right people, always finding fault with different things in different churches. The church is too loud. And when we were up in worship, I think my watch must be an Episcopalian because my, my watch always says, it's too loud. <laughs> I need a Pentecostal eye, eye watch. So I was telling me, it's too loud, it's vibrating. Turn the noise down. <laughs> and the wounds, wounded hearts find healing in the embrace of community. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of community I want. Yeah. Koinonia is the dance of diversity, where differences are celebrated as a vibrant colors of masterpiece painted by the creator's hand. Amen. What does Cornelia look like? And so I invite you because Cornelia is a sanctuary of authenticity yeah. where masks are discarded. Whew, that's how revival comes. Discard the mask. Come as you are. Come as you are. And the souls are free to dance in the light of truth. Amen. That's what Jesus died for. And so in closing, Cornelia is not an event. It's a homecoming. God who created you is calling you home to himself. And in finding God, you will find yourself. And we create a, a space in which people can find authentic and real community. I want you to bow your heads right now. And I want to pray for those of you that you need an homecoming to your own self. You need to be to surrender yourself to Jesus. And you say, Lord, I'm coming home. That's going in here. And so if that is you, you say, Pastor, I need to come home to the Lord. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm tired of the masks. I'm tired of being a fraud. I'm tired of pretending. I want to come as I am and begin my journey. If that's you, I want you to raise your hands because I want to pray for you. Is there anybody here? Say, Pastor, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Thank you for your hands. Anybody else? Thank you. Everybody say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, today is my coronation. It's my homecoming. 
thank you for loving me in spite of my faults and failures I confess my sins before you and I accept your love into my heart I am free to be me through Jesus Christ Amen let me say one more prayer Amen if you're here today and you're a Christian but you've been wrestling you carry the burden of pretense because there are things you're really struggling with but you you want to be a part of this community that loves I'm going to ask the leaders to come the leaders to come out but you you've been your self-esteem has been taken a beating. Your spirit has been taken a beating. And you want to experience the radical, inclusive love that embraces you. If I'm speaking to you, I want you to stand to your feet right now. Just give me one more minute. If I'm speaking to you, stand to your feet. Pastor, I want to be honest. I need prayers. I need prayers. If I'm speaking to you, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My last prayer, my last call is this. If you're here today, hallelujah. Come, my sister, come. Come. If you're here today, he said, Pastor, I don't just want to belong to this church, but I want to join the fellowship of the Spirit. And that can remember now, koinonia means you have a part in something. Not that you visit, you come, but you have a stake. You, you give investment and you also you receive, you, you have a stake. And you say, Pastor, I'm willing to go further in this relationship and after the church today, those of you who want to take the first step, you've never been to meet, meet the pastors before, you're not a member of the church, but you want, to, you want to take the first step in becoming a part of this community, I want you to meet us up to the church. We're going to meet in the foyer. We're going to meet in about 50 minutes. We're going to speak to you about 30 minutes and tell you a little bit more about us. I want you to stay behind if I'm speaking to you. So as I close, if I'm going to ask the worship, the, the prayer team to prepare. And if you are here today and you need to come home to yourself, I want you to begin to feel free to come forward. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, let's stand together. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come today, we thank you for this divine embrace of koinonia. We come today, Jesus, excited that miracles are birthed. Lives are transformed because we are the authentic people of God who are the, the conduits of heavenly vision and power. May you bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want prayer, I want to invite you to come. They'll pray for you. But may the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, rest and remain and abide with you now until Jesus comes. And everybody say, Amen. and before you go, before you go even, have a coffee with somebody. Don't just keep your head down and make your way to the car. The coffee shop's open. Grab a coffee. Stay, stay for five minutes. Some of you are too quick to leave. Stay for a little bit. We don't have to rush to work. We have coffee, we have, we have pastries, and meet someone. God bless you in Jesus' name. Come for prayer. Amen.